we're going to be talking about dealing with stubborn demons. Dealing with stubborn demons. When it comes to deliverance, Christians aren't the only ones with the history of confronting the de demons. Egyptians, Persians, Canaanites and a host of other cultures actually sought to invoke and remove demons. Um, in fact, even in Dead Sea Scrolls, we see that Solomon cast out demons. We see that David wrote songs about casting out demons in Dead Sea Scrolls and Josephus wrote about that. Exorcism, deliverance was practiced by Jesus and His disciples and it actually has become a lost art in the church. But if you look at Synoptic Gospels, so those are Matthew, Mark and Luke, uh, if you look at Synoptic Gospels you will see that one-third of the chapters contain instances and references to demonic supernatural. One-third in the Gospels and Synoptic Gospels refer to deliverance and to demons. Every casting of demons was done in the public. And something that we have to kind of keep in mind is that Jesus was a deliverance minister. Jesus was casting out demons. His followers were doing exactly the same. And in the first century, sometimes I hear people say, well Vlad, you know, you don't see in, in, in the epistles and the book of Acts an em emphasis on deliverance, therefore deliverance died out. Actually in the first century there was a little said about deliverance because it was common, expected and it was the apostolic ministry. In the second century, the influence of the apostles was, sti was, still, was still felt and so there was no need to emphasize that as much. In the third century, the church moved further from the influence of the apostles and it became necessary to emphasize the importance of deliverance. I'm going to read to you just two quotes from church fathers. One in the second century, Justin Martyr. And he said this, he's an, he was an apologist and he said, for the numberless demoni demoniacs, so demonized people throughout the whole world and in your city, many of our Christian men exercising them in the name of Jesus Christ who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, have been healed and do healed, rendering helpless and driving the possessing devils out of the men though they could not be cured by all other exorcists and those who have used incarnations and drugs. So pretty much this second century church father is saying that church is driving out demons in the name of Jesus and they are healing people through the ministry of deliverance and people are being cured through the ministry of deliverance and these deliverances are happening to people who are not able to receive that deliverance by other people trying to do deliverance on them. Like there's a video that's circulating on TikTok concerning Muslims doing deliverance on people. And so there's a lot of people attempting to do deliverance. People in New Age are attempting to do deliverance. But church fathers said that, hey, Jesus' name is the only thing that's powerful. This is in the second century. Now if you go another church father, Origen, church father and Alexandrian theologian, he said that his name, the name of Jesus, has already been seen in unmistakable manner to have expelled myriads of evil spirits from souls and bodies. So guys, deliverance is not supposed to be the lost art that it has become today. It's not supposed to be the, 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 the lost practice that it has become today. God wants to restore that. It's not about only casting out demons. Please hear me loud and clear. We know that. You may say, so why are you emphasizing that? Because people have demons and because it's not being emphasized as much and because some people who do it, they are weird. Okay, and so God wants us to do it in the way that's balanced, in the way that brings God glory and in the way that actually glorifies the name of Jesus and helps people that are demonized. And so as you start the ministry of deliverance, as you start going into the ministry of deliverance, as you start seeking deliverance, you will come across this problem. There are some demons that seem to be stubborn. We don't like them stubborn demons but they seem to be there. What do you do with stubborn demons? How do you confront stubborn demons? And so that's what we're going to look at 
today. Now, I don't want to just take our experience. I want to actually look at in the Scriptures. And in the Scriptures, we're going to see how Jesus dealt with one case of two men that were demonized and they had a lot of demons, a legion. And the reason why I'm going to bring this case up today in re referencing stubborn demons is because Jesus commanded demons to go and they did not. Now, I would encourage you to read this story for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Read this story for yourself and you will be surprised. This doesn't mean that Jesus didn't have any power but it does show us and encourages us that Jesus commands the demons to come out and they didn't at first. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Now before we address the actual stubbornness of demons, let's lay the groundwork. The first thing that I want to highlight today is that demon possession in the New King James Version is the word that is used for being demonized. Why am I saying this? First of all, is because in Mark chapter 5 verse 2, it says that a man with an unclean spirit. In Matthew chapter 8 verse 28, it says two demon-possessed men. In Luke chapter 8 verse 30, 27, it says who had demons, meaning a man who had demons for a long time. I want you to see the difference. The reference is about the same story. A person that is possessed, right? Two people actually that are possessed. But Mark and Luke says a man with an unclean spirit, a man who had demons. So, Demon-possessed men are used, demon-possessed terminology is used interchangeably with a man with an unclean spirit or someone who had demons for a long time. Why is that important to highlight? Because the original word that is used many times in the New Testament and especially in the Gospels, the word for demonized, um, the Greek word is daimo, Nizoami, I think that's the correct word, I'm not Greek so, but that word occurs about 13 times in the New Testament, exclusively in the Gospels, seven times in Matthew, four times in Mark and then um, once in Luke and in John. This word means, many times it's translated as possessed, but that's not the best translation of that for us because the word possessed for many of us, it freaks us out. So we're like, yes, of course Christians cannot be possessed. But the case of demon possession, it says in one reference possessed man, in other reference it says un man with an unclean spirit. And the other reference it says one who had unclean spirits. So what does that mean? Original word means to be under the power and control or influence of a demon. Even the word possessed does not carry the idea of ownership but control. Now, because Christians many times have fought over this possessed part. Can a Christian be possessed? Well, no, Christians cannot be owned by a demon by Christ but Christians can be controlled by a demon. So I want to lay this foundation first and foremost to say that when demons are on the inside of a person, they can control a person. When demons are on the outside, they can seek to influence a person. For example, when you have alcohol, alcohol doesn't possess a person when it comes inside of a person, but it influences you and it makes you act out of character. That's how demons are. When you get demons inside, it's like getting an alcohol. Alcohol doesn't own you, yet it can control you. Same thing with the thief. When a thief comes inside of your house, the thief is inside of the house, but it doesn't own the house. So when a Christian has a demon on the inside, it doesn't mean that the demon owns a Christian. It simply means that a demon is inside of a Christian and that demon needs to be driven out of a Christian. It needs to come out. It needs to be, Christian needs to be delivered from that demon. And the Bible uses words like possessed, 
but the original language really means demonized, meaning, meaning being under control of a demon. So Christians can have demons, people can have demons on the inside of them and one of the signs is control or one of the marks of demons on the inside of you is control. Demons on the outside, they influence. Demons on the inside, they control. Now some of you may be asking, well what about the Bible says the light and darkness cannot coexist together? Well first of all, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that light and darkness doesn't have fellowship. Righteousness and lawlessness doesn't have communion and that is used in the reference to support that Christians should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, do you know a Christian who is unequally yoked with an unbeliever? I do. So it's not something that Christians are not capable of doing. It's something that Christians are encouraged not to do. So it's not something that you can't. It's something that you shouldn't. And then Paul uses a confirmation for that and says light and darkness don't have communion. Righteousness and lawlessness doesn't have fellowship. So Paul is not saying righteousness and lawlessness doesn't cohabitate. It says that, that, they, uh, that they cannot coexist, but it says that they cannot have a covenant. Because if a Christian and non-Christian don't coexist, then how can we evangelize? We coexist with unbelievers, but we don't go into covenant with them. Light, light and darkness can coexist, but they do not have communion. Righteousness and lawlessness can coexist, but they don't have fellowship. So what does that mean? Darkness cannot drive out light, but light can drive out darkness. And lawlessness cannot overcome righteousness, but righteousness can overcome lawlessness. And so demons cannot overcome Christ, but Christ in a Christian can drive out demons. So with that squared away. So first thing that I wanted to highlight is this, is that you can have demons on the inside and they can control you, okay? To what degree they control you, it will depend on the kind of demons, the kind of legal right, generational curses, soul ties and the kind of access that you give them. There could be extreme levels of control that the person has. But we don't see a clear distinction in the New Testament. Now I understand I'm going to open can of, uh, a can of worms right now. I don't see a clear distinction in the New Testament between oppressed and possessed. In the New Testament it uses one common language, demonized meaning controlled by a demon. And people who have more degrees than me, who have studied Greek, one of them is Derek Prince whom I respect and in his book and he said that that word has nothing to do with ownership. It has to do with control. So when a Christian or a non-Christian has a demon, it's about control not ownership. Now a non-Christian is owned by the devil because they don't belong to Jesus Christ. But a Christian is owned by Jesus and even if a demon gets inside, whether through an open door or through generational curses or other things, these demons can be cast out and the person can be free. I had a one time where my house broke in, was broken into. We had a lady, a girl that lived with us, uh, with me and my wife. She was helping us to uh, pay rent and then a few other things and she left the window open. And um, we had this service in the park and while we had a service in the park, we come back and I hear the wind in the house. And um, lo and behold, I look at the room that she stayed in. The window is wide open. Somebody went through all of her stuff. Stuff got turned over but nothing was taken except the car. <laughs> the car in the driveway was not our car but the thief stole the car, okay? Now when the thief got inside, he didn't become the owner of my house but he was still on the inside. So a Christian can have demons if they live their life continuously in sin. If they open doors to demons, demons will and they can get in. And you speaking in tongues, going to Pentecostal church and your dad being a pastor is going to do nothing to stop that. If you don't live holy, you don't live righteous, you expose your life to demonic influence. The same way as if you don't live holy and righteous, you potentially can, you will grieve the Holy Spirit and you can open the door to demons. And so, but it doesn't mean that those demons will own you. It just simply means that they will torment you and harass you. But today there's hope 
and there's freedom and there's deliverance. Amen. Come on somebody. If this is helping somebody, drop number one in the chat and drop a fire emoji. If you're just logging in or tuning in, some of you just tuning in, make sure that you hit thumbs up to this video. If you're re-watching, let us know in the comments below. I am re-watching. Now, so the first thing that I mentioned is that um, what we call demon possession is really being demonized, controlled by a demon. And the, if we are very honest, in the scripture it does not puts these people who are demon possessed in this very bad category and then there's the rest of the people who have demons are in like a lighter category. It's just people can have different measures or levels of control that a demon has over them. Um, and so that's what we see in the New Testament at least. The second thing I want to highlight and this is the most common questions that people ask and that is how do I know I have a demon? So when I look at the story of a stubborn demon situation and this is the story of this two men who had a legion of demons who were called demon possessed in one reference. Uh, in the other Gospels, so not the Gospels, they were called uh, men with a demon with an unclean spirit and someone who had an unclean spirit. How would you know somebody has a demon? Let's, I give three simple ways to know. The first one is through the gift of discernment. So how would you know somebody has a demon? Through a gift of discernment. God uses the gifts of the Holy Spirit and one of those gifts is discerning of spirits. Now this gift doesn't just discern spirits, it also discerns God's spirits, uh, God's spirit or angels and human spirit. But it does discern demons. The second way you would know a demon, if somebody has a demon, or if you have a demon is if you manifest when prayer is offered. Now Jesus comes on the scene, He arrives on the shore and this man who was bound with chains, who was living among the tombs, who was naked, who was hurting himself, somebody can look at him and say he is schizophrenic and diagnose him with schizophrenia. But the moment Jesus comes, he starts to manifest demons. So that's another way to know that somebody has a demon. When they manifest, when prayer is being offered. There are many people that have demons but because nobody ever addressed it or nobody ever taught them that um, and offered them solution, what happens is that they go all their life either on medication or they're going all their life trying to control a particular urge or trying to control these compulsive thoughts and then they come in the presence of God's anointing, the presence of powerful ministers and men and women of God who know their authority in Christ and these people start to manifest and then finally everything makes sense. Oh, I've been going through all this stuff and all of these things are not normal, they are demonic. But they didn't know that because they were never in the presence where prayer, I call them confrontational prayers, was offered. I've seen it happen in their, in their services, I've seen it happen in their conferences where prayer is being offered. Sometimes the very presence of the Holy Spirit during a sermon and the person starts feeling extremely uncomfortable. They want to run, they want to yell and they hold back and they can't hold back anymore and they just scream out. Some people from a Baptist background, Catholic background, whichever background and they say, I don't know what's happening. Some of them are very like dignified, you know, very calm, reserved people and that would happen. Why? Because demons can't hide when you turn up the heat. When the fire is increased, they become uncomfortable and they become tormented and they are exposed. Now some people are against this idea of demons manifesting in the service. But I think it's very important that we allow that for a few reasons. Demons actually do not want to manifest. Mm -hmm. They don't want to manifest. They want to stay hidden. As long as they are hidden, they can continue to do their dubious things. They don't want to manifest. When demons manifest, the person battling with those demons 
honestly finds a, a moment of relief to know that some of these problems they've been having are not due to their own problems but actually there's somebody else causing these problems. That's huge. And you must understand it's the fire of God that causes them to manifest. And so, and most people then figure out, okay, now I have a demon because I am manifesting, all right? Sometimes you don't know that you have a demon because it's not manifesting. But when it's manifesting, it's very clear. You got a demon and you got to be set free. And so it's very clear, plain and very simple. The third way to know that you have a demon, it's not only the demons manifesting. So like Jesus shows up, these two demon-possessed guys with demons manifest. So it's very clear. You don't have to even have a gift of discernment. You're just looking, they're manifesting. That's obvious. Now, sometimes in our churches, there are demons manifesting, but we call it the Holy Spirit. When somebody's hissing like a snake, barking like a dog on, on the floor, you know, or trying to expose themselves, um, or uh, saliva coming out, or coughing non-stop or screaming like this person is in pain, you can be pretty much certain that's not the Holy Spirit flowing, overflowing. It's an evil spirit that's manifesting. And I've been to meetings in my younger days where people would come even to our services and somebody is manifesting and, uh, and they would come and they would say, people who don't do deliverance and who don't understand deliverance, they would say things like, more Lord, more, more. <sighs> not more. We need less of that. We need, we need deliverance, not more. And so, or sometimes a person starts hysterically laughing at you. Like, just like it's not normal. And so, and that's when, when you know, I mean, I believe that sometimes people even laughed under being influenced of the Holy Spirit, but this is different. It's mocking laughter. And so, and you have to go and cast out demons. So, how do we know somebody has a demon? Well, we look at these demon possessed two guys. Jesus shows up, they manifest. We said that through the gift of discernment. But the last one is through the activities of demons. Now, these two demon possessed guys had they were naked, lived among tombs, they were seized many times, they were bound with physical chains and they broke them. They needed somebody to be a guard for them. They self-harmed, they cut themselves and they were driven by demons into the desert. And night and day they were crying out. That's pretty much a portfolio right there. That's pretty much a resume. That's pretty much, you know, this is pretty much enough symptoms or signs that you have company, you have an unclean spirit. When you have intrusive thoughts, when you are demonically, you have these third voice speaking, when you have these things happening around you and in you that are just out of this world, paranormal activity. When you have all of these things happening in your life, you most likely have a demon. Even if you don't manifest, you still need to be delivered. So, stubborn demons. First thing that we highlighted right now, the most important one, is that you can have a demon and having a demon does not mean you're owned by one. Any more than if a person has an alcohol in them, doesn't mean that alcohol owns them. A thief breaking into your house doesn't mean that thief now is on the title deed of your house. So we should not be um, worried about that. The second thing is we mentioned is that um, demons manifest when a prayer is offered and a lot of times when they don't manifest you can still know if they are there or if you have them based on the symptoms or through the gift of discernment. In the case of these two demon possessed men, it was Jesus' presence caused them to manifest and the signs in their life indicated that they had demons, okay? So now we are looking at the third part and the third part is the one about Jesus arriving on the scene. First of all, I want to highlight that on the way to the deliverance with stubborn demons, Jesus had a storm. In this storm, um, 
they were actually almost like dying. Disciples were almost dying and in this storm Jesus rebukes the storm. It's interesting because it's the same word that is used to rebuke demons. So I believe the demons were responsible for the storm. So on the way to this deliverance, doing this deliverance, there was already an attack. Demons, I think they already felt something is going to happen to us and so they wanted to stir some trouble. But Jesus slept like a baby, got up and rebuked that storm and that's what we have to do. When sometimes on the way to doing a deliverance, stubborn demon deliverance or you're on the way to your own deliverance, you might encounter a storm. And I've seen this honestly happen almost every single time. Almost every person that is doing deliverance or is coming for deliverance, mainly coming for deliverance and they have, I call them stubborn demons, on the way to their deliverance they experience crazy stuff. Have you guys ever experienced that when you were on the way to being delivered? Like your car breaks down, you run out of gas, um, you know somebody calls at work, um, you, you trip over and then you have to be admitted to emergency. I've seen it all the time. The flight gets delayed and it's like the enemy wants to frustrate you so that you don't get delivered. And so, and what's important is that you persevere through that. When you are about to be delivered, the enemy could stir up a, stir up a storm. So you have to take authority even on the way to deliverance and take authority and still go there. Don't let the enemy stop you. And this is my third point is that don't let the devil stop you from getting to your deliverance. I'm not saying getting your deliverance, getting to the place where you can be delivered. These stubborn demons, okay, they were powerful but they could not stop these two men from getting to Jesus. They didn't stop Jesus from getting to those men and they didn't stop men from getting to Jesus. Did you catch that? Jesus overcame the storm and got to the men. But when He arrived there, the Bible says that these men, they ran to Jesus and they got on their knees, worshipped Him, okay, and cried out. The demons started to manifest. Now, if you know anything about the enemy, you know one thing is that he will never make you run to Jesus, okay. So if you think that demons made these men run to Jesus, you're wrong because demons they draw us away from Jesus, not to Jesus. Only the Holy Spirit brings us to Jesus. Demons draw us away from Jesus. Oh Isaiah, thank you for your um, generous gift. Everybody shout out to Isaiah. Go subscribe to Isaiah's channel so that Isaiah can have as many subscribers as me. <laughs> I love you bro. Um, so demons, they can't stop these men from getting to Jesus. The Bible says that these men came and worshiped Jesus. The only people who don't get free are those who don't admit that they are in bondage. A lot of times what begins to happen is that we allow demons to deceive us that we don't need to be delivered or some of us are in the place where we allow demons to hold us back from our deliverance. At the moment that you're about to be delivered, you know, you either get a phone call or you have something bad that happens, car accident or on the opposite, maybe you finally get this breakthrough you were expecting. So now you're canceling your appointment to go for deliverance. You're like, oh, I think I, I got a problem fixed. No, you, you don't have a problem fixed. The devil just gave you a band-aid so that you don't get your true deliverance. And so these two men, they were running to Jesus. Maybe at, in that day, that Jesus came within their vicinity, they probably didn't get tormented that day. And this would be a good moment to say, oh, we experienced relief. We don't need to be delivered. We don't want to go through all of that stuff. We don't want to be embarrassed. What if it gets recorded and posted and, and all of this stuff? All of these lies the enemy will feed you. And so Jesus had to overcome the storm to get to dealing with difficult demons. And these men who had difficult demons had to overcome the difficult demons to get to Jesus. That's even before they got delivered. We're not even dealing right now with getting delivered. We're talking about getting to your place of deliverance, which is very important. Something that Reverend Bob Larson said that really, it kind of changed something for me. 
He said this, he said, the parts of your life that demons do not control are more powerful than the parts that they do. Come on somebody, drop that in the chat right now. The parts of your life that demons do not control are more powerful than the parts that they do. In fact, what Reverend Dr. Bob Larson told me over a dinner with him, he said, even if the enemy controls 99% of your life, we're not talking about ownership. Again, remember we're talking about control. If he controls 99% of your life, the 1% he doesn't control is more powerful than the 99% that he does control. The human will is so much more powerful than demonic control. And therefore, you can use the little bit of that human will left and push yourself, drive yourself, get yourself, have somebody take you to your deliverance. Have somebody take you to the deliverance place, deliverance minister, deliverance conference, deliverance, uh, whoever, get there. If a legion is 6,826 soldiers, if 6,826 demons could not hold a man from running to Jesus and worshiping Jesus, I am pretty sure you don't have that many demons. They shouldn't keep you. Don't believe the lie that your demons are more powerful than you. Even if they are in control in some areas, they cannot hold you back from getting to your deliverance. Now they will try, but they shouldn't be able to succeed. Many people do not get full or any deliverance at all from their stubborn demons because they let their demons create a stumbling block for them to get to deliverance. You will have resistance. Overcome that resistance. Paralyze that resistance with persistence and get to your freedom. You remember when the woman came to Jesus and her daughter was demonized? Um, things were not looking very good for her. Um, Jesus was ignoring her. This would be a good moment to walk away and say, uh, not today. No, that woman she didn't give up. She persevered and she received crumbs but it was enough to set her daughter free. And that's what God has in store for you. Complete, full deliverance in Jesus' name. Come on somebody. Is this helping anybody? If this is helping somebody, drop number one in the chat. Drop that fire emoji. Go ahead and share this broadcast right now. Hit thumbs up as well. If you are re-watching, make sure you let us know that you are re-watching. I see a lot of you guys in the in the chat on YouTube already giving. Uh, thank you so much for your support. We really appreciate um, your support. Now, now we're getting to the part about dealing with stubborn demons. Number four, most demons will leave quickly, but some are stubborn. Now, <laughs> Some of you, I'm pretty sure you're, this is not a shock, okay, or a surprise. Most demons will leave quickly, all right? So many people are afraid of stubborn demons, so they're, um, they don't want to do deliverance at all because of stubborn demons. Uh, but majority of the time, your demons that you're going to deal with in delivering somebody are not going to be stubborn. But every once in a while, you will get a stubborn one. Now, I want to highlight that this case of Jesus doing deliverance on the demon-possessed men was a stubborn case. Not because there were so many demons, but in Luke chapter 8 verse 28, the Bible says the demons spoke out. Now, I never saw that until actually just a few weeks ago. And I shared this with my wife and she was like, man, this is amazing. But interesting insight, Luke chapter 8 verse 28, demons speak out, okay, Man they like manifest. But in the next verse 29 it says this, For He had commanded the unclean spirits to come out of the men. So demons speak out and the next verse it says, 
before he had commanded the unclean spirits to come out. So demons are speaking out because he commanded them to come out. Now did you catch this? They didn't come out. He commanded them to come out and they didn't. They spoke out. And Jesus starts an interrogation with those demons. Okay, so let me, for those of you who already caught that, please be patient with me. Jesus commands demons to come out. And Luke chapter 8 verse 29, it says that for He commanded them to come out, but in 28 they speak out. Why is that important? Because Jesus in His ministry of deliverance encountered more difficult cases. Now, did Jesus ever fail in deliverance? Never. Jesus doesn't fail. But this becomes a good example for us in doing the work of Jesus. That Jesus commands them out, they don't come out. Instead, they speak out. And they actually, Jesus has an interrogation with them which we will talk about in just a second. So why is that important? That don't take it personally when you're doing deliverance and demons don't come out right away. Don't believe into this lie or don't let the enemy convince you that somehow you are doing something wrong. Even though sometimes there are few things we can improve on. So now it brings me to the part of why demons don't leave. Okay? The first reason why they don't leave is because you're not maybe dealing with the demon at all. Now this may be a shock for some people but there are cases and we've encountered that where you are attacking but you're actually not dealing with the demon, you're dealing with a mental illness or you're dealing with a wound or a fragment of their personality or somebody else's personality but you're not dealing with the demon at all. And when the only tools in your toolbox is casting out demons, you will treat everything as a demon. And it's not correct. Just because it looks like that or it shakes like that, it's important to not to jump to conclusions that it's a demon. On the opposite, it's better to be skeptical than to be 100% convinced that if a person coughed or they shook that it's a demon. Now I understand some of you like, whoa, everything is a demon. Not really. I remember one lady was shaking and people came, out, 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 out. And they brought me in, Vlad, come over here, come over here, help, help her out, help her out. Begin to uh, deliver her. And I said, I asked the husband, I said, what is happening to her? That's all I asked. And the husband said, oh, she has a tumor um, and in her brain and she has seizures anytime she gets exposed to particular lights. And I said, like, like lights we have on the stage? He's like, mm-hmm. And so I asked the team, I said, pull back. Now, is it true that sometimes you can have both mental illness and a demon? 100%. But it's important that you don't rush right away and you take a little bit of time and find out what's happening. Do you remember when they brought a boy to Jesus who had a mental illness? Jesus didn't rush to doing deliverance. He asked the father, how long this, has this been happening to him? What, what's, what's, what's happening to him? What has happened to him? What's the situation? What's the story here? That's why it's important that we, we talk to people. And sometimes, instead of jumping in right away, that we actually ask him, hey, have you been to the doctor? Um, have you been diagnosed with anything? Have you been put on medication? Mm-hmm, okay. When was the last time you took that medication? I remember praying for one case. Actually, I was a part of a conference where people were praying for this girl who honestly haven't taken medication for three days because somebody had the audacity to tell her to not take that medication and she was having a lot of mental illnesses. And no question that she had a demon, she probably did. But in this case what they were dealing, they were not dealing with the demon. It didn't respond to the name of Jesus whatsoever. 
it didn't respond whatsoever to the authority of the name of Jesus. It cussed, it hit people and everything and a lot of times and it didn't look, it wouldn't look in the deliverance minister's eyes. And so these four, that I would call them three, four things when it won't look at my eyes, when I command it, it disrespects the name of Jesus because demons they tremble and they obey and it will physically get violent. Demons are violent but the moment it starts hitting you, demons can do that but it's typically not the demons, it's the mental illness in the person or the person's will interfering as well and wants to hit your split personality part and so and those are kind of the signs that you would look for and there's many more that it's probably not a demon and so you would want to stop and actually talk to the person and see what's going on and sometimes you need to actually help them to get in the healthy state so that you can deal with the demon not with the wound disorder or a personality split okay and this is more common than you realize otherwise you will spend eight hours straight or sometimes when we had that we, we prayed one time for one person you know we bound um, a person physically it was we were praying for this cousin of mine actually and uh, uh, during the night you know he came and he did so much drugs so he was so high and he took these particular drugs that um, that made him uh, just hallucinate and act really weird and honestly you know when the only thing you do is deliverance you start deliverance so we had to physically bind him the reason why is because he would punch the walls he would punch his mom and all of that stuff and he would curse and lie and just like just really really nasty and so uh, we did that for about I think almost all night and then in the morning we got tired so we called the police um, but honestly they br uh, brought him to a institution or whatever the thing that they put him into put him some um, put him into a detox he came out and then he eventually ex received his deliverance but he needed to go through a detox because he was actually high on drugs and so did he have demons 100% but we were not effective in doing the deliverance and it wasn't because we were encountering a stubborn demon is because we were encountering a drug addict somebody on drugs okay and so that's why it's important that just because somebody manifests and you're not seeing the breakthrough like ask the questions is this person on drugs right now now can God supernaturally zap them out a hundred percent um does this person have mental illness um when was the last time they took their medication does this person have a split personality as well? And so, um, and so there, there's a lot of other things. So I would really be weary of just, um, this is not us saying, oh, this is not our fault um, that we can't drive this out. Let's blame it on somebody else. This is us doing our due diligence with difficult cases. The second thing of maybe that demons are not leaving, they're stubborn. The second reason is that demons are actually too strong. Now, something that I want you to consider is the Bible says that when a demon leaves a person, not is cast out but leaves a person, he goes and finds seven more wicked, demons more wicked and that speaks in Matthew chapter 12 verse 45. Seven more or seven other more wicked. That tells us that some demons are more wicked. Some are more powerful. Some have higher ranking, have more power in them than others. Not all demons have the same power. The fact that seven more, seven other more wicked tells us that some are less powerful. Now, is the name of Jesus more powerful than any demon? A hundred percent. We're not dealing here today with can His name. We're just dealing with the reality that you stepped into a battle where you are dealing probably with something that is just more heavy than what you've experienced before. And that could just take a little bit longer or that could just take a little bit more of homework or a little bit more of working with this person. But the reality is some stubborn cases you're really dealing with more demons and more wicked demons. In the case of Jesus and the demon-possessed man, I mean they had a legion, okay? Even if they had the weak demons, you know, put 6,000 weak demons and you have a pretty much a problem on your hand. You know, a problem that is not a, no problem for Jesus, but it's still a problem for you. 
and for me and it could take just longer and more work with this person but sometimes you can have not just more demons within the person but actually more wicked demons that it could take a little bit longer for you to work with this person to experience freedom and maybe you are on the receiving end and you just have more and more wicked demons that it will just take um, not longer for Jesus to drive them out but it would be longer for you to receive your complete freedom. So that's the second reason why demons wouldn't leave is because number one is that actually maybe you're not dealing with a demon. Number two is that you're dealing with something that is more demons and more wicked. The third reason is lack of faith. On your end, lack of faith. So Jesus said, in Matthew chapter 17 verse 20 when disciples had a failed deliverance he said that because of your unbelief that you couldn't drive this demon out. So sometimes what happens is that you have no faith in Jesus' ability to use you to deliver somebody. And so I really would encourage you to not doubt God's authority in you when you're doing deliverance because one of the things that stubborn demons will test is actually your faith and if you yield to unbelief and you begin to entertain these thoughts and though I don't believe that demons can really read your thoughts without you giving them permission of course but um but they can project and they can see your face, facial expressions and the tone of your voice and the, the firmness and the confidence in your, um, in, your, in your voice. The moment you yield into that, that this is not going to happen, deliverance will not happen, man I should have prayed more and all of this stuff, then what you're doing is that you're pretty much yielding to lack of faith and lack of faith can be the cause why you can't cast them out. And so don't doubt God's authority inside of you. Don't doubt that the power of Jesus is very powerful inside of you, okay? The enemy will want to make you doubt that. We just had a, uh, a Sunday um, service, I think it was last weekend, yeah, and a person that came for deliverance and as I was uh, praying for deliverance, you know, nothing was happening and then I didn't leave this person. Um, as I start praying more, um, Holy Spirit just kind of prompted me to linger a little bit more with this person and you know person start coughing and all of this stuff and then um, and then the demon just threw this mocking laughter at me you know like and then oh you're nobody and, and all of this stuff and so and with me I've, I've done this you know not once or twice and I've heard all kinds of bad stuff about me from demons so like that doesn't um, um, doesn't affect me anymore and I actually started to laugh. I don't encourage you to do that uh, because deliverance is a serious matter and, and I, I am very serious during deliverance. I don't laugh, um, I don't do this stuff but this time I just had this laugh inside of my spirit and it did come out, okay? So I wasn't like hysterically laughing but deep inside I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. You demon, you have no idea. This has nothing to do with me, my name. I don't have faith in Vlad, I have faith in the Holy Spirit, I have faith in the name of Jesus. And so I, I did let my laughter come out just a little bit and within, I don't know, a minute or something, the demon was on the floor and the person, I believe the person was delivered. And so um, don't doubt Jesus' authority in you. If you do, uh, some demons won't leave. They'll right away spot it, they'll spot it in you, they, they'll see it right through you that you're not sure that you're not confident, that you are doubting, that you are not convinced, that you're not sure and, and they just won't come out. And so be sure, be confident, stand your ground and the devil will make fun of you and say, you're not powerful enough, I will never leave. Uh, that's just theatrics. He just does that to throw you off balance. Stand your ground. As sure as the rising of the sun, you are supposed to be in this place and this person is going to be delivered in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, the fourth thing that happens of why demons don't leave is because your personal walk with the Lord is weak. 
uh, Matthew 17 verse 21 after Jesus rebukes disciples for not having enough faith he says but this kind leaves by prayer and fasting now some people say that this kind mainly relates to prayer to unbelief that unbelief is removed through prayer and fasting but I don't really believe in that the reason being is that unbelief is really dealt not with prayer and fasting but it's dealt with trusting in God's Word and standing on God's Word. I do believe that the difference between Jesus and disciples that failed in deliverance is Jesus spent uh, pretty much 24 hours in on the mountain uh, fasting um, most likely because I don't think He was eating there and then He spent time with God in prayer and disciples were just on the bottom of the mountain you know dealing with deliverance and they were not very effective. And so this is not to take it personally into ourselves and feeling guilty but if you keep seeing that you have a lot of failed deliverances uh, maybe it's time to kind of relook at your life. Are you walking with the Lord? Is there purity in your life? Is there prayer? Are you living a life of fasting? Are you living a life of commitment to God? Sometimes demons are too strong and other times we are just too weak. We have lack of faith in, in Christ in us um, and sometimes when you have a relationship with God that's not good, it cripples your faith, you know, because you, you lack confidence because you know that you're not pleasing to the Lord, you you don't live your life in a way that honors Him and so unfortunately you can't walk in great faith, I believe, as a Christian if you know that you're living in compromise. And so now you can try to, you know, kind of uh, fill yourself with this self-confession, you know, I have great faith, you know, Christ is in me and all of this stuff and, and though there are verses of people practicing lawlessness and casting out demons but generally it doesn't work. Um, consistently. Okay, you can't do this for a long time. You might do it once or twice but you can't do this for a long time. It will backfire if you live a conscious, habitual life of prayerlessness and no fasting. Which gives me an opportunity, I'll take a little pause and for those of you that are just logging in or tuning in, I want to remind you that we are having a challenge 21 day challenge in January and as you're seeing that on the screen right now um, we are doing a 21 day of prayer and fasting. So for those of you who feel like your spiritual batteries are not where they're supposed to be, um, this will be a good moment to start preparing for that prayerfully. Um, I know not everybody can fast this long, not everybody can fast at all but majority of you can fast something and for some time and begin to prayerfully consider that, uh, to do that. Uh, let me walk with you during that season of building yourself in prayer and fasting. All you have to do is just go to pastorvlad.org forward slash fast forward, sign up for challenge and it's completely free. It costs you nothing to do uh, that, to be a part of this uh, group that will do this fast. Now the last reason why demons won't leave is the person receiving deliverance has not met conditions required for their deliverance. Sometimes it's as simple as they have not confessed a sin, they haven't renounced something, the soul tie wasn't broken, generational curses were not broken, demonic objects were not removed in their house. Sometimes you're doing a deliverance and they actually have a demonic object in their pocket. Sometimes you're doing a deliverance but this person at that present time actually habitually and consciously lives in sin and they need to be repenting, they need to renounce and they need to forgive. Sometimes if I am dealing with a case where um, it's difficult, it seems like I can't get a breakthrough, I stop the deliverance and I ask the person, hey is there anything that you need to repent as we're doing deliverance, is the Lord bringing anything to your mind. Have you, do you have any unforgiveness toward anybody? Um, are you currently living in things that are not pleasing to God? And if you know they say those things then I lead them through the prayer um, and then I go back and attack the demon. So if the person hasn't met the conditions for deliverance and you're just going out, 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 you know um, sometimes you, you just save your voice and just pull back and just talk to the person and see what's happening there and then see if there's something else that needs to be dealt with, something else uprooted, renounced and broken before you continue deliverance. 
Okay, now let's bring it to the last point. And the last point is demons can be interrogated to help you with deliverance process of stubborn demons. So we have mentioned already that uh, Christians can be controlled by a demon but they're not owned by a demon. We use the examples of alcohol and thieves. We've mentioned already that no matter how strong the demons are, you still can get to your deliverance. They will try to create a hindrance for you but you shouldn't stop, uh, let them do that. We have uh, also um, mentioned that how do you know that you have demons is that if you manifest during prayer or if there are activities of demons in your life, these signs mean that you probably have unclean spirit. We mentioned that stubborn demons sometimes are normal occurrence for people who do deliverance. It happened even with Jesus. Don't take it personally. Um, maybe do a little interview with the person. Don't just kind of assume that it's a demon. Um, be Have a little bit of skepticism which is healthy. It's not It's not bad to have a little bit of skepticism. Um, not skepticism that you don't believe the person saying that they have a demon but that you do a little of investigation and a little bit more of asking questions. Um, sometimes demons are too strong. The Bible does say that some demons um, there are more and then there's more wicked. Meaning you're not just dealing with one, maybe you're dealing with more than one demon. We also mentioned that um, demons will smell if you lack uh, confidence in the authority of Jesus. So don't give them that pleasure and uh, be confident in Jesus' authority. Um, don't neglect your prayer and fasting and then make sure that the person you're dealing the deliverance with has met conditions for their deliverance. Um, I've done sometimes deliverance where the person doesn't want to be honestly delivered as much as I want them to be delivered and we would do deliverance and you know a person would be free only to go back home that night and actually do exactly the very same thing that they did to get the demons and the next day we would deal with demons more powerful. Um, not because their deliverance invited more powerful demons, it's because the person went back to their old life and so we would deal with demons way more fiercer and I remember we, I dealt with one person like this for about three weeks, um, almost every day or every other day doing, deli doing deliverance and it was very uh, exhausting and honestly um, I just stopped afterwards and I, we kind of told the person if you're not ready to be free, um, we'll be here but you're not ready to walk away from that lifestyle that you're involved in and so we, we can't help you, I'm sorry man. but keep your demons if you want to keep that sin, if you want to keep that open door. And so because otherwise you know I can't be spending two, three hours every single day for you to only go back and intentionally, habitually do exactly the same thing that got those demons in the first place. Now let's just say that you're walking in prayer and fasting, you're not doubting your faith in Christ, um, you are dealing with demons that are more stronger, more wicked, uh, the conditions for deliverance have been met from your best understanding. What do you do then? Um, you do what Jesus did. Interrogate the demon and command the demon to reveal why it's there and it's not leaving. You can actually do that. Jesus actually did that. Now He didn't, in this case, did not ask the demon, why are you there? But we know that He asked the questions and demons spoke out. And so one of the things that you can practice and do and that is to ask a demon why it's not leaving. Command it to tell why it's not going. And so and then you do the very thing that the demon says of why it's not leaving, you know, to combat that. So if a demon says, no, this person um, hasn't forgiven, then you deal with unforgiveness. Now this idea of talking to demons, you must understand that we're not talking to demons. I'm talking to you right now, okay? I have a calm voice, We're, I'm talking to you, I hear your chat, I see your chats but I'm actually, you know, not screaming at you, I'm not interrogating you, I'm just having a conversation with you, okay? Now when you're interrogating a demon, it's not a conversation, it's an interrogation. Now there are ministries who would say, you know, don't ever let demons manifest and don't ever let demons speak out, like bind the manifestations and tell them to be silent because Jesus said for demons to be silent. But Jesus said for demons to be silent and in some of the references, the next verse you would see Jesus telling people who were healed to be silent as well for the same reason. 
he did not want his fame and his notoriety to spread too fast because he came to die not necessarily to be well accepted and liked everywhere and so that's why he told many people he whom he healed don't tell anybody but after his resurrection he told everybody to tell everybody about him but in the land of Gentiles Jesus doesn't forbid the demons from speaking because it's a different territory in fact he even tells the man after he gets delivered go tell everybody that you got delivered so almost like a change of tactic why because the idea of don't let the demon speak was specifically for the purpose of Jesus's fame not spreading too fast and Jesus did not want his divinity or that he is a son of God to be heralded by demons okay you and I are supposed to be spreading the message of Jesus not demons demons seem to be better evangelists than some of us okay demons were actually never atheists they believed in Jesus's humanity and divinity and people still have a hard time wrapping their mind around that oh Jesus wasn't son of God Jesus uh, you know was not really a human he was just God you know but not human and then Jesus was God but not, uh, Jesus was human but not God people always trip over these two things demons demons didn't have a problem with that so Jesus did not want demons um, proclamation to be the foundation of people's um, belief and he didn't want them to spread the news about him but you can interrogate demons because Jesus did. A few reasons why you could consider interrogating demons during a difficult case because they can actually reveal the real reason they are there. Now you may say well Vlad but demons lie. It's true they do lie. They are lying spirits. They are unclean spirits but in every case in synoptic gospels where demons spoke out they said the truth. They didn't lie. When the fire of God is pressed against them they are obligated to say the truth. Now do we take everything the demons say and th that's as a pure truth? Of course not. We compare it with God's Word and you force them to say what is happening. Now some people say well Vlad I don't want to hear what demons say. I'm just going to rely on what the Holy Spirit says. In the area of deliverance, if you only act on the prophetic instead of interrogation of demons, you will be also misguided. As much as if you only rely on what demons says, you can be misguided. Um, we teach people to not rely on the prophetic and not to rely 100% on what the demons say you rely a little bit on both, on the Holy Spirit but also interrogate demons and force them to tell the truth. Now I understand some of you just got shocked. You're like, what? You don't want us to rely on the prophetic to get the demons out? Jesus could have easily relied on the prophetic and said, demons don't tell me how many of you are there. I know it's a legion. No, He asked the demons to tell them that information. Now did He knew? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that He did but He still had demons confront that. I've seen people during deliverance do some really shady stuff because of prophetic. Not every prophetic is equal. Okay, there's some genuine prophets and there's some people who think they're prophets. I remember one lady, and this happened in our church, this lady doesn't come to church anymore um, and this girl is manifesting and it was a difficult case. We couldn't get the demon out and um, uh, we couldn't just, we just had a difficult case. And this lady comes out and she just points her finger in her stomach and she says, I know why she's not getting delivered. She had an abortion. It's a spirit of abortion. Like, and she says, God said it's a spirit of abortion. So, you know, eventually we talked to the girl and, you know, she's like, I've never had an abortion. Um, my mom, you know, from my best understanding, never had an abortion. And, uh, and so, but the prophet now, you know, of course, who do you blame? Of course not the prophet, you blame the person. Oh yeah, the person must be lying. But the prophet can't be lying because you know prophetic words are always accurate. The Bible says to judge prophetic words. And so I encourage people during deliverance to rely 100% on the Holy Spirit. But also if you're dealing with a difficult case, put the demon in the corner and tell the demon to tell you of why it's there, why it's not leaving, what is the open door, what is the legal right. Sometimes in some cases I actually what I do is that during the deliverance, I actually, when the demon reveals why it's there and then we deal with the real reason why the demon is not leaving and then I come back to the demon and say, hey, do you still have any legal right? And then the demon will say no. I said, 
then you have to go. So what I would do is I would actually, and Bob Larson does that, is I would actually make the demon pronounce its own doom and say, I bind myself with my kind and we go together or we lift the curse from this person and we go together to the pit. And I make the demon pronounce his own doom. And I definitely saw that in Bob Larson's ministry. And then once the demon says that, and then we, we just, we force that demon to go. Um, sometimes we can ask God to release His angels to help us in that process. And then we say, demon, you got to go because you just pronounced that in the name of Jesus Christ. And so that's kind of how the demonic interrogation could help in a difficult case. And so um, do you have to do that all the time? Probably not, but it, it does help in that case. And so um, that's pretty much in a nutshell. Um, the last thing that I would highlight is to um, the sixth thing that I would highlight, the last, the last thing pretty much at the end is that you tell the demons to go to the abyss. Um, the Bible says that they did not want to go into the abyss. They begged Him that, they, that He would not command them to go out into the abyss. Abyss is the term for the underworld as the prisoner of the disobedient, as the realm of the dead. In the New Testament, abyss is a prison for the Antichrist, for demons, for scorpions and for spirits. Now, uh, we don't really know why Jesus allowed demons to go into the pigs. Um, there's different versions and I've read quite a few of them. I have my own theories for that but I don't really know why. I do know that we are to send demons into the pit, into the abyss and so for them to be tormented. We do know from this story as well the demons can possess or own control, control enter into animals and they are really really not wanting to leave people's bodies. They always are looking for a body. Something that I want to conclude this teaching on is when you get delivered, not everyone is going to be happy about that. You would think this man's deliverance would bring such a great joy to everybody. In fact, a lot of people were pretty upset and they asked Jesus to leave. And this man who was delivered, genuine deliverance, you know that somebody genuinely got delivered when they want to follow Jesus after that. This man begged Jesus, pleaded with Jesus to pretty much leave his uh, neighborhood, his country and follow Jesus. See, th this is where I believe you really know that you are delivered, okay? When you have a passionate desire to follow Jesus. If you're delivered and all you want to do is do your own thing, um, then I don't know if you're truly delivered, okay? Maybe you are delivered but you still need to be delivered from self. You still need to die to yourself. Um, but genuine deliverance is when you get freed and you want to follow Jesus um, passionately. And this story of this deliverance, you know where why it shocks me? Is that Jesus does not let this demonized, possessed man with demons follow Him. He tells him to go back home. So imagine this, this demon-possessed guy has not had any Bible training. He has not been discipled. Imagine the danger of sending him back to the region where he was tormented. Can you imagine how many trigger points this guy had? Our culture talks about triggers today, you know, and can you imagine how many triggers this guy had? Seeing the same place, the same people who didn't want his Jesus, who didn't celebrate his deliverance. Imagine looking at the person who lost all his pigs <laughs> because this guy got delivered and Jesus sends him back home to tell everybody about what God has done. He doesn't know much about Jesus except that He got delivered. He doesn't know what to preach except that I was delivered. I was tormented and now I am free. That tells me that sometimes genuine deliverance, the power of God will maintain you. The fear of, oh what if I go back? Don't live like that, thinking that. Oh what if they come back? No, it's about you following Jesus in whatever situation that you are in right now. Even if you're in a place where there is no local church, tell everybody about Jesus. That's what real deliverance is. I heard one pastor said actually that the history said that actually this man eventually started a church there and there was a uh, church that was started in that region because of this man's testimony. Whether that's true or not, we'll find out in heaven. But 
one thing is certain is Jesus pretty much sent him to the unknown without proper training, without proper discipleship, back into the region where he came from. My, my thought that he sent him back to that region because the demons, though they left the men, they did not leave the region. They entered the pigs, but they killed pigs because they really are looking for bodies and they'll settle for an animal body, but they need human body. They love human bodies. They can't do their work without being in the body. Demons can't operate without being in the body. And I think Jesus sent that man back to the region because demons that he got delivered from are in that region. And I think a lot of those demons were harassing a lot of people or would be harassing a lot of people. And that man and his testimony would stand in contrast with whatever demonic influence that was happening in that region and bring people freedom and bring people hope. Because as the devil sent, you know, legions of those demons to that region, yes, Jesus permitted that. We don't know why. But Jesus sends that man into that region. And the people in that region did not want Jesus. But Jesus left a witness in that region for those people. And maybe you are that witness in your region. Maybe you are that witness in your church. Maybe you are that witness in your family. Where you feel like you're the only one. You experience deliverance and nobody understands you. You experience freedom but nobody accepts you. Nobody wants that message. Nobody wants what you experienced. And you're like, I'm packing my bags and I'm leaving and I'm going to Hungry Gen. Man, we would love to have you at Hungry Gen. But make sure you follow the Holy Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit want you to leave? Or does He want you to stay in that region? To stay in that church? To stay in that place? So you can be a witness. So you can be the difference maker. Maybe you say, but Vlad, you don't understand. I'm not really trained. I'm not equipped. Well, can I ask you a question? Do you think that this man who just got delivered from a legion and his friend, two men, the Bible says, do you think that they were equipped? Mm -mm. They simply encountered God. And sometimes you encounter God, you start reading the Word, you get to podcasts like these, live streams like these, and they provide you with equipment, with training, and you can do it, go and do the work of evangelism, discipleship and deliverance on other people because you've experienced that. Amen. I know this was a word for somebody. They needed to hear that. So now we've come to a time I want to pray for you. Um, has this been a blessing to anybody? Have you guys received this? Uh, received this message? Has this helped anybody of what you were um, hearing uh, today? If you have, drop number one in the chat. Let me know in the comments below if this was a blessing to you, if you were receiving um, this word today. So um, let me know that and we are going to uh, go and start praying just in the second. We're just going to start praying in just a second. So let me know um, in the comments if this was a blessing. Drop number one, drop that fire emoji. If you have not like the broadcast yet or if you have not shared this broadcast yet make sure you do that right now we're about to go and pray i do believe the presence of jesus is in this studio i feel his anointing i felt this morning and even throughout this day that today is going to be a powerful day of deliverance for people and um and i'm trusting that the holy spirit is going to use this time right now so let's go ahead and share let's go ahead and like let's go ahead and um hit thumbs up if you're not subscribed subscribe and then let's go into prayer in just a second drop that fire emoji if you are ready for that prayer come on somebody and before we go into that prayer I just want to say thank you guys so much for your giving I want uh, to say thank you for your um, contributing to the ministry uh, the funds will go to help us release books uh, courses and other content uh, to people all around the world. We translate our books, we translate our content into Spanish, into Russian, 
and as well as into Romanian language right now, into Armenian language, into uh, Lithuanian language, um, a language in India. And so really excited what the Lord is doing through our ministry. Um, and honestly guys, because of people like you, even the fasting book, you know, it's already translated into Russian and Spanish. Um, it's already released um, and so and because of I have this amazing team and I'm able to have this team because of your giving. So I just want to say huge thank you for everybody who's been doing that during this holiday season who have been giving and if God places on your heart uh, or if you feel led to do that, um, you're welcome to do that through the chat, through the Cash App, Venmo, PayPal, um, crypto um, website or the whole nine yards. So thank you again. Lord, I thank you for your grace. Come on, let's get ready to pray right now. Just place your hand upon your, yourself or your head. Lord, in Jesus' mighty name, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your kindness that you reveal today through your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. I thank you that you gave yourself for our salvation, Lord, for our healing and our redemption. I pray right now for every single person that is watching this broadcast that is re-watching this broadcast, that is listening to this broadcast on the podcast. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Spirit of the Living God, come into that room right now. Spirit of the Living God, come into that car. Come into those earphones in the gym, on that run, even in that vacation home. In Jesus' mighty name, I bind every unclean spirit that is tormenting your life in the mighty name of Jesus. I take authority over every stubborn demon, every unclean spirit, harassing, tormenting, abusing you, every spirit that is attacking your sleep, every spirit that is attacking your sexuality, your thoughts, your mind, every spirit of infirmity in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, right now come out in Jesus' name come out in the mighty name of Jesus. Loose your grip, be uprooted, be gone right now in Jesus' mighty name. In the mighty name of the Lord. I break your grip right now. I command those unclean spirits, spirit spouses to come out right now in Jesus' name. Holding somebody's marriage, holding somebody's purity, harassing somebody's sleep, causing miscarriages. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, that Lilith, that night spirit, in Jesus' mighty name, in the mighty name of Jesus, every Jezebel, loose your grip right now. Come out in Jesus' mighty name. Come out in the mighty name of the Lord. I command every spirit of fear to come out in Jesus' name. I command every spirit of depression and anxiety to come out in Jesus' mighty name. Holy Ghost, fire in Jesus' name. Holy Ghost, fire in Jesus' mighty name. I command every spirit of infirmity to loose your grip right now and come out in Jesus' mighty name. You unclean spirit of infirmity that's causing chronic disease, that's causing problems in the joints in Jesus' name, that's causing problems in the spine in the mighty name of Jesus, come out right now. Come out in the name of Jesus. Up and out in Jesus' name. Loose your grip off of this person. You spirit of Pharaoh, let God's people go right now. Every spirit of bondage, of addiction, come up and out right now. You spirit of addiction, come up and out right now in Jesus' mighty name. I take authority over every spirit of harlotry, every spirit of lust, every spirit of perversion, every spirit of homosexuality, lesbianism. Come out right now. Come up and out in Jesus' mighty name. Come up and out in Jesus' mighty name. Be free in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, fire. Holy Spirit, fire in Jesus' name every witchcraft, every spirit of divination, every spirit of scorpion, every spirit of python, every spirit of snake, every spiritual viper, come out right now in Jesus' mighty name. Be free 
in the name of Jesus. Be free in the name of Jesus. Come on, place your hand on your head right now. Come out in Jesus' mighty name. Come out of this person right now in the name of Jesus. Holy Ghost, fire in Jesus' name. Some of you, you will, you will feel a manifestation. It's fine if there's somebody near you, they can lay hand on you as well and pray for you. But just be free right now. Cough it out, vomit it out, uh, scream it out, whatever, wh whichever way, just, just, just get it out of you right now in the name of Jesus. Be free in Jesus' mighty name. Be free in the name of Jesus. Holy Ghost, fire in Jesus' name. A spirit of perversion, come out in Jesus' mighty name. Intrusive thoughts, hearing somebody like in the, in the third person, in Jesus' mighty name, be free right now. That unclean spirit, come out of you right now in Jesus' name. That unclean spirit of heaviness, come out right now in Jesus' name. Deaf and dumb spirit, come out in Jesus' name. Every spirit that is causing setback, stagnation, that steals progress, destiny thief, destiny stealer, in Jesus' name, come out right now in Jesus' name. Be free in Jesus' mighty name. Be free in the name of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, fire in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, drop that in the chat. I receive. I receive in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us know in the comments of what's happening to you. I know that some of you are, are experiencing right now a deliverance that is taking place. Just receive that from the Lord in Jesus' mighty name.